Hello again, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, today we're going to talk about Cruel Morning, Shiloh, 1862. Uh, I did an unbagging a little while ago, and I wanted to also uh, kind of do a bit of a rules overview. Now, this game, I have to admit, I don't know much about Civil War history. So, when I came into this, I really didn't know much about the specific Battle of Shiloh, except for what I learned on the back of the the game, you know, rule book, and you know, so I know it's a Union victory. So the way this is set up is, uh, you know, we'll look at rules, but we'll take a look at the scenario because this this doesn't look good for Union troops. So let's just take a look here. So first of all, as we said in the unbagging video. Uh, you have the main scenario, it, it covers two days of fighting, and then the rest of the scenarios are different options. Better Confederate attack plan, uh, a day two only scenario, you know, covers reinforcements and whatnot, and then some other options, the Fort Donaldson division and so on. So there's quite a bit of replayability. So I'm just going off of the first scenario, it covers two days. So it tells me, based historically, where the initial Union forces are. And then with a time tracker, which, if we move up here, I do have the time tracker right here. You start at 7 a.m. I put the first couple hours worth of Confederate reinforcements there to remind me when they're coming in. Uh, but otherwise, this is our initial setup. So the game tells you specifically, and it's really nice, so it'll have uh, by, you know, where you first start, says by division, and I'm telling you, this chart on the back of the rule book has been outstanding aid. Uh, even though all the units are color-coded by division, it's really nice to have because this has a nice hierarchy, all the divisions, and then the color. So when I have all the, the counters separated out, like in my counter tray, it was just really easy to go and find everybody that I needed. Plus, this is super uh, handy for when you go to do your activations. It kind of gives you an idea of who can activate. Uh, that's important because, again, I don't know much about uh, the Civil War history, so I know there are players who have a real strong foundation and knowledge of divisions and who are leading the different divisions and brigades. I don't have that. So this was a fantastic player aid on the back of the rule book. So once you have your initial troops set up, this is what it looks like. So this is day one. Uh, the turn track starts at 7 a.m. here, uh, the Battle of Shiloh. Now, as you can see, and this is what was kind of interesting for me to see as it's laid out, the Union troops look to be in a great disarray. I don't think they were expecting a lot of fighting. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, hello, it's a nice, beautiful day. Let's, uh, let's, you know, do what we do on a nice, beautiful day. And then you have up here a major Confederate gathering. So, like, these guys are prepared to fight. And when you play, my goal, you know, because I, I tell you, this is why I was playing solo. My wife, she normally helps me with games but uh, she's really not that much of a Civil War fan so I was playing this on my own so I was spending my time trying to bring Union forces together to kind of form a, a line because I have a lot of people to bring up uh, because you're trying to capture these victory point places and there there's stars here on the map so there's a few here that I would want to push through with the Confederacy to get and we're, we're in a bit of a disarray and then your Confederate troops are nicely concentrated because, again, you know, they're doing a nice coordinated attack. So all of this makes sense. And what I want to do is kind of walk you through a turn. Now, the turn isn't really going to allow for a lot of, of combat, if much at all, because the Union troops are spread out. But what I want to do is just kind of explain to you how this would affect the game. Alright, so here you have your initial layout. One of the things that's important for you as a player is knowing if your troops are in command or out of command. 
and every unit leader, so for example, I'm going to grab Prentice here. Every leader has several statistics that are important for them. Uh, let's see, focus, focus. So the first number adds to a unit's like a, attack strength. The second number adds to a unit's skill. Then the third number is their range of influence. And then the, the other number, which is like a light gray, is their uh, initiative which is going to be used for for different activities uh, also on here there's a an optional letter which I don't know if you can see on Prentice but he's got in his upper right hand corner a P in a circle and there's an optional brigade let's see what it's called I didn't use the optional rule I gotta learn just the basic rules first but there's a brigadier personality rule so uh, A is aggressive C is cautious P is prudent so it says things like brigade cannot move and whatnot. So it's kind of cool. It gives you just another depth of of playing and deciding, you know, exactly how you can move your troops and, and do things with them. But let's just say you're not playing with those optional rules. This is what you've got. You've got your command radius. So like Prentice has a command radius of two hexes. So he's got a unit out here. This is uh, Peabody's brigade and he just happens to be two hexes away so he is in command now I have down here though this guy he's out of command this is Stuart he belongs to Sherman to the division commander Sherman uh, and actually Sherman is way up here and Sherman has the rest of his division next to him so Sherman great commander he's got a four command radius so one two three four so this guy down here, who is, who is that Peabody? Yo, oh, Stuart. So Stuart is definitely out of command. Uh, that's going to have some effect. There's rules for units that are out of command. Uh, in fact, if you have the game or you know, curious about the rules, page 5 it talks about units in command or out of command. So brigades are command if they're within range of the leader's command range. If you're outside, they have to pass a quality check to potentially be activated. So if you activate like a division, and uh, they would have to make a, a check to see if they could be activated. And then combat units that pass a quality check must roll a die and subtract one from the result. And then that will determine their movement. So a normal brigade gets five movement points. Leaders and cavalry get nine movement points. So even if a unit is out of command, there's a chance that it can still move. Uh, you know, so there, there's some things out of command can do, but that, that's why I put the out of command marker on my initial units that are out of command, just to give me a quick reminder. And again, just to kind of really show you how in, in a disarray that Union troops were. The other thing too, before we jump into rules, just to kind of go over how the scenario is set up, which I, I thought was an interesting thing as well. So the Union Army starts out with a certain amount of divisions here at the 7, 7 a.m. and at 9 a.m. they get grants, they get some, uh, another artillery asset and some other divisional, well one other divisional guy and then just throughout the day they're gonna get units. They get them and the reason why I say they get them is because they're not labeled as reinforcements. There's actually a special rule in here that talks about reinforcements and you roll to see if they come in since these Union units are not labeled as reinforcements, the way I play is they just arrive in the hex that they're supposed to arrive. So that is, you know, kind of a, a balance to the fact that the Confederate troops come in organized and there's a lot more. So already it has a little bit of balance. Now, the Confederates get some reinforcements too, but they're actually labeled as reinforcements. So when you look at the rules, you'll see if you got your book, page 13, it does actually say, Confederate reinforcements. They are specifically labeled as such. So when I played, I play the reinforcement rule. And basically it just says you roll a die and just so I get the exact rule, it's like on a six they're delayed by a couple of turns and a four or a five they're delayed by one turn. And if you, I think it's a one, two, or three, just because I mentioned it, I thought I would look. Yeah. So on a roll of four or greater, oh, on a roll of four, I got the numbers backwards. Four or greater, they arrive as scheduled. Two or three, it's the next turn. And then a one, they arrive two turns in the future. So on my turn track, for those who do something similar, 
since I knew that this Confederate guy was coming in as a reinforcement at 7 a.m., what I would do, that way I, I have a reminder who's coming when. So at that part of the, the turn sequence, I could roll. And I'll just keep rolling until he can come in. He rolled a four. But then I know he can arrive. Whereas the Union troops, I don't make a roll for them because they're not specifically labeled as reinforcements. It just says, here's when Grant arrives. Uh, so that's what's interesting is there's some give and take, some balance there between the, the two armies as they bring troops on. It's very kind of cool. Now, let's talk about the game. So let's say we're playing this. One of the things the scenario says is the Confederates start first. Also, it gives us our starting command points. So there's a lot of rules here. Well, I won't say a lot, but, but it talks about initiative, talks about something called the Battle Surge. Grant. Grant always arrives as scheduled. Units that accompany him, however, may be delayed. Now, the only thing is, since they're not specifically labeled as uh, reinforcements, <laughs> I just play that they arrived. But when you read that rule that says Grant always comes at 9 a.m., but the other people could be delayed, I guess technically those should be considered reinforcements. So, you know, you could play that by ear a little bit. Kind of kind of play by what you think will work for you. Um, but it also says here some special rules for like Johnston, Beauregard, Webster's Artillery, 40, 47th Tennessee, Gunboats, Artillery Recovery. So there are some specific rules for this scenario that are detailed out here for you. Okay, so what do you do in a turn? Well, we have a turn sequence. It's pretty simple. There's an initiative phase. Now, for the scenario, it says that the Confederates win initiative. Now, when you're doing regular initiative, though, each player rolls a die. So we'll say the Confederate rolls, Union rolls. Now, in, in case of a tie, then it says that the player who did not have initiative last turn gets the initiative. If it's the very first turn, unless the scenario says, then you just keep rolling until there's not a tie. Now, it also says, though, past that first turn, that uh, if you roll a tie, then you would roll on a random events table. So they do have a random event table. It's triggered during initiative, and that's if you each roll the same number. Okay, so there's some rules about initiative. So we already know that the Confederates are going first. Uh, we already checked for random events phase. Then there's the artillery bombardment. So you have a lot of decisions to make when it comes to artillery. In the artillery bombardment phase, I got an artillery unit right here, uh, you can bring them on and you got to bring them on to basically to like a, an attached unit uh, or like it says here attached unit. So we place it yeah, combat units wish the artillery is subordinate. So when I was looking here, and this is this is important too, the artillery division is pretty much subordinate to the Army of Tennessee, and then that's the the commander is Grant. So in a way, the way it's laid out is I guess I could attach it to any division under under Grant. I know that sounds almost like a question, but that's kind of how I played it. So the artillery division, those individual artillery pieces aren't attached to anyone specifically. Whereas if you look over here with the Confederates, you'll have the artillery, uh, some of them are directly attached to like the first corps commander, for example. So I would put the artillery on somebody in the first corps. So the unions, I think, are a little more flexible with the artillery, and then the Confederates, I think, think how it's played is they're a little more inflexible and again that that kind of comes from my civil war lack of knowledge but that's how I'm reading the the chart and the rules uh, which is great though because you still have a couple decisions if you want to bring in artillery and your setup for the scenario tells you which artillery pieces are available at each segment of the game and I have two available as a union player now what you can do is place them now to subordinate units and then they can do a bombardment attack but you don't have to uh, also you could place them to the board 
but you don't have to bombard with them. It's just a chance that you could go ahead and maybe bring them on the board. I need better tweezers and attach them to a unit. Or you can actually save your artillery to perform counter battery. So if I was a Union player and if the artillery could shoot that far and it effectively, you know, it shoots, then as a Confederate player, I could then take one of my artilleries that has not been used, I could drop it down, and then it could do a counter battery attack against another piece of artillery. It doesn't even say it has to be the artillery that just fired, it said against any artillery. So there you have a couple options. Do you want to place artillery now if it's within range of the enemy, attempt a bombard, do you want to save them for counter battery, or just place it and leave it there for a while. There's some additional rules with artillery. There's also a gunboat. The gunboat falls under the artillery rules because it's, it's listed as one of the artillery assets. The only thing is you're not going to place it over land. You're going to place it down here along the Tennessee River. Now, once your Confederate troops are, are coming on, you probably don't want to place a gunboat immediately until you have Confederate forces down here in range. Um, because it doesn't have very good good range either and the way artillery works is that the as you in, near the end of the turn you roll to see if the artillery gets removed from the board and then comes back at a later time so you want to be very careful with your placement of artillery because if you use them at the wrong time then it would be delayed before they can use again and that, that could make a difference in combat I've seen so lots of decisions with artillery after you do your artillery bombardment phase, it goes into the two player phases. So the player with initiative, they'll do an activation, movement, combat. Then, after he's finished those steps or she, your opponent, the second player then does the same thing. Activation, movement, combat. So how do you activate? That probably is the one I struggled with the most. Again, because I don't understand, you know, uh, fully all of the divisions and how they're attached to each other. And the Union forces here are listed a little bit differently than the Confederate troops. So with your Union troops, they're listed by an Army commander. So you have the Army of Tennessee, the Army of Ohio, Army of Mississippi. And then under each of those Army commanders, they have their divisions. And then each division is made up of a brigade. Okay, that kind of makes sense. I'm good with that. Then the Confederates, they have corps, so they have like the army, overall army commanders with no direct attachments, but they have all of their corps. And they have 1st Corps, 2nd Corps, 3rd Corps, there's also a reserve corps. And there's an Army of the West commander with his directly attached units and then his divisions. Now, the way that the, the activations work is the scenario says you have a certain amount of of uh, command points each turn. So the Confederate soldier, according to the scenario, they start with nine command points. And the Union soldier starts with one. So again, this is really showing you that the Union troops were in a disarray and trying to get themselves organized was a real struggle. Whereas the Confederates, coming prepared, they have a better chance of activating a lot of units and moving them because they, they were set for fighting. Now there, there is a saving grace. The Union soldier, according to the scenario rules, there's a couple cases where they get more command points as the game progresses. So for example, at um, when, you, when Grant arrives, which is at 9 a.m., we then the Union soldier starts getting uh, an additional three CP points. So then he gets four command points. And then also, Later on, it says when Nelson arrives, you get plus two. And then the Confederate stays at nine. Now, there is a rule in here to get to randomly see if you get extra CPs. Uh, so when you start your activation phase, that'd be the first thing. You look at how many command points you have. You roll a die six. So it says on roll six, you receive no extra CP. If the roll exceeds the Army Commander's initiative rating but is less than six, that player receives one extra CP. If the roll is less than or equal to the Army Commander's initiative rating, the player receives CP equal to the die roll. All right, so for this setup, we don't have Army of the West. All we have are 
Um, Jackson, who is this guy? Beauregard, I think. So what I've got to do is i got to look here, and I've got, or is it Johnston? Oh, it's Johnston. Uh, so Johnston here has, let me hear, his rating, it says their initiative, let me think. I know I just read it to you. Make sure I get it. So we're going to check it against his, yeah, initiative rating. Okay, I had that right. So if you roll, I'm hoping that focuses with my hand. There we go. So his last number there, that four, is his initiative. So I rolled a four. He's got a four. If it's army commander, let's see, it's less, if it's less or equal to the army commander, you receive, oh, you receive equal to the roll. Oh, all right. So I rolled a four. He has initiative of four. So I get four more CP. So I could mark that. Well, you can't see the turn track. I'm not going to move it for every time we do something here. But nine plus four is 13. So the Confederate player has 13 command points that he can spend. Wow, that's phenomenal. Uh, because then I have a chart here, which is on the back of the player aid. It's in the rule book as well. But it tells me how do I get to spend? All right, so I know you haven't seen anything move yet. I'm just kind of explaining how the rules work. So right here you have spending the command points. One command point to activate a leader or a combat unit attached to the army commander. Uh, with Confederate forces, you can activate a unit that's attached to a core commander. So if you look at the, the charts, uh, there's like one guy that's got like a, a brigade attached to him but um, so for the basic part that I got here I didn't see anything attached other than artillery and artillery has different rules for activation uh, or it says you can spend one command point to activate one brigade if it passes a quality check so I'm not gonna read every single CP activation but let me just say as a union player when you start you're not doing a whole lot <laughs> so uh, the one thing you can do though is it says units that don't activate there's a chance that they can move. So if I wanted to activate specifically a brigade to go and maybe fall back so we can start forming a line, I, I as the Union player with my one CP, I would pick like say Peabody. The Peabody's out here by himself. Or maybe this guy who's out of command. I might want to try and activate him. Well, when you're out of command, let's see, you get a what was it, a penalty for your die roll to see if you activate? No. Oh, you get a minus one die roll from your movement point. Golly, combat units to pass a quality check must roll a die and subtract one. So if I wanted to try and move this guy back towards Sherman, I roll a die and I gotta make a quality check. Well, let's take a look at a unit and see what some of these numbers are. And you'll see that the Union troops, they got it tough. They got it tough with these initial troops. Alright, let's see. So the first number, the 7, that's their combat strength. That guy is pretty strong. 7 is about the highest number I've seen. Uh, but the second number is his quality. That's like poorly trained troops. So uh, the 7 represents about 400 people. So there's like 2,800 people under Peabody, for example. But to activate them, they're, they're poorly led or poorly trained. So if I want to activate this guy down here, Stuart, he has a 1 activation. So I have to roll a 1. Oh, I rolled a 1. So I could activate him, but then I roll, subtract 1, and he only gets 4 movement points. So if I want to move back towards Sherman, I might want to consider moving on roads. Because like most games, you have movement and terrain effect charts that you can deal with. So for example here, terrain. Um, roads, half of a movement point. Uh, so there's some rules for that. So if I wanted to move this guy, if I get my four movement points, and you move it half on a road, oh, these tweezers are not the best. One, that's one movement point. Maybe I'm gonna go this way. One movement point, two movement points, three movement points, Four movement points. I want to move him back to Sherman because Sherman has a command radius of four. 
One, two, three, four. Great. So I moved that Union troop up. Now you might say, but Eddie, didn't you just tell me the Confederates had initiative first? Yes. I'm just kind of demonstrating. Remember, I'm not going to actually get to play a full turn because it takes a while to explain how these rules work together. Now, I also did the Union guy first because he only had one CP. Now, later, like I said, there's a chance that you can, um, you know, well, that's if a unit fails activation. Yeah, pretty much you're, as a Union, that's tough. One CP starting out is really tough. Now, if you do try to activate a unit and it fails, then you still get to make a roll to see if it can move. All right, so we're activating units here. Uh, now the Confederate player, he gets his 13 because that's how I rolled. And the long list of CPs, I could like try to activate all combat units in a division under a core commander. Cost 5 CP. 4 CP to activate all divisions under a core commander. So again, I could look at my army and try to activate all the core and try to get everything moving. And then you would make individual rolls to see if a division activates. And you make sure that, that you know the brigades activate. So a lot of that just comes down to uh, dice rolls against their skills. And the Confederate troops here starting out, a lot of them have much higher skills than the Union troops. So there you go. Let's say, fast forward here, I'm the Confederate troop, we've done some moving, uh, let's, let's move through woods, woods cost a certain amount of movement, but let's just say we've moved, we've moved some people here. We'll move him up. Because again, that's, that's the big part of the Confederate troops here. Now the other thing too is you might have all these command points but you only get to activate and move stuff and fire with them in combat once. So activate them, do your thing. And the way combat works is pretty simple. Let's just say we've moved a bunch of Confederate troops. Combat happens when you've moved adjacent to the enemy. So that's what this game is about. This game is about maneuvering your troops. So I'm going to say that I followed all the rules accordingly, used all my command points appropriately to activate all my division commanders, and, and we're all moving. And now the Confederacy has moved. We now have a unit that's adjacent here to some Confederate troops. So instead of moving uh, my one guy here, Stuart, to try to get back to Sherman, maybe I should have moved Peabody back because he's... He's kind of right up there all by himself. Now, the combat, it pretty much says all combat's mandatory. So if you have troops adjacent, they're going to fight. And they fight everything. Uh, so this is really interesting. So essentially, these two stacks of Confederate troops are going to attack Peabody. And so Peabody's got to try and hold off that. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> so let's talk about combat. So once your movement's done, you go to combat, you do get a defensive fire phase. So with your defender, he's going to pick one unit to attack. He doesn't attack a stack, so he picks one unit within the stack to fire at. So he's looking, uh, he's going to fight this brigade here, Wood. So seven versus five. So with defensive fire... Each defending combat unit, they get to perform their defensive fire against attacking combat enemy units. So that's what he's got there. Now, the way it works is you're going to make, as the attacker, a die roll. And you modify that based on a couple of, of situations. It says, plus one if the attacker's in the clear. Well, the attacker is attacking from a wooded force, so he's not in the clear. Uh, plus one if the fire unit's quality rating is four or more. <clears throat> quality unit of the <coughs> excuse me, the quality unit is a one, so it, there's no pluses for that. Uh, there's a plus one to your die roll if the attacker is damaged. Well, the attacker is not damaged; they just got here. Minus one if the fire unit's quality rating is one or two. So this unit has a quality rating of one, so the attacker is going to have a minus one die roll modifier. 
That's to his advantage. If the unit's being under fire has a quality rate. Oh, we just read that one. Oh, if the unit being fired upon. Oh, sorry. Yeah, if the firing unit's quality rating is one or two, if unit being fired upon has a quality rating of four or more. Uh, so he's only this wood only has a quality of two, so he won't get another bonus for that. Minus one per additional unit involved in the attack. Well, we have a couple units involved. So we've got a unit right here. The uh, commander is not a combat unit per se. So there's another minus one. In the attacker, minus one if the attacker is in a force. The attacker is in a force. Oh my goodness. So you take all these, you roll, you apply your minus three that we ended up here, and you compare it against your quality. It's a quality check, essentially, or a skill check, right? Uh, so I just happen to roll really bad. So even though this guy is attacking out of the woods, I rolled a six, and with your modifiers that we had, <gasps> wood only has a skill of two. Oh my goodness. So our little one skill Peabody guy actually causes this guy to flip to his wounded side. Or if he was on his wounded side, I would have eliminated him. So Wood's rushing in, and because I have a whole bunch of people in there, they fire back. Now you go into the combat, you do a combat results uh, ratio. So we have here Shaver, and there's no bonus for their commander. So he's six points, Wood is three, uh, one for Hardy, he's in this uh, hex. So he's going to give this Wood a four. So it's six, four is ten, Peabody has a 7 strength, so luckily that's going to give us a 1 to 1 combat ratio. Whew, Peabody might survive. Now, like with all good war games, you just simply take a look at your combat odds. So here's the 1 to 1. And you have here uh, modifiers to the quality roll. Uh, basically, when you take your damage, you're going to roll against each brigade's skill and modify it by this result. And you want to roll under your skill. So the attacker, in this case on a one-to-one, -one, because he didn't overwhelmingly attack, he gets a plus one modifier to his skill roll. The defender gets a zero. So the defender is going to work out in their favor. So when you attack, you definitely want to attack with overwhelming numbers of firepower. If, and it's possible that if I had not taken damage, let's see, oh no, still wouldn't have mattered, 12, yeah, that would still would not have been enough for a 2 to 1 results. So yeah, again, this game is all about maneuver, you gotta maneuver the right people at the right time. Also your stacking limits will make a difference, you can have up to 10 strength points in a hex. So if you really, really want to coordinate your attacks, you're going to put a stack of 10, a stack of 10, maybe even have three hexes engage somebody. So you can try to drive your attack odds up in your favor to like 3 to 1, 4 to 1. All right. Uh, but in this case, we just kind of move some guys and end up with a 1 to 1. So then it has all kinds of column shifts. Are you under battle surge? Uh, scenario 1, I think, even mentions that the Confederate player has battle surge right away. Yeah, Confederate units have a column shift to the right on the first three turns of any scenario starting on April 5 or 6. This starts April 6. Attacking Union units have a column shift to the right for the first two turns of April 7. So essentially, column shifts to the right. Oh, okay. So on 1 to 1, the column shifts 2 because the Confederates have a surge. Now we're at minus 1 die roll for the attacker, plus 1 for the defender, and then there's some more. You know, are the defender in the hill, are they in the open and whatnot. So what does that mean? Let's just say, then, we had this result right here. Minus one for the attacker, plus one for the defender. Again, it's a skill check. And again, it's going to be against all the people involved in the combat. It's a group effort. So Wood took some damage, and he gets a minus one to his skill check. So I rolled a three, and it's over. And because he's already wounded he's going to be shattered. Now we're going to set him aside because there's rules for bringing back shattered people later on. Uh, then you have Shaver. He's got a skill of three because he wasn't wounded at all. Oh wait, you know what I forgot? 
You know what I forgot? He's got a Commander Hardy with him. That brings his skill to two. I had rolled a three, I think, and I picked up the die. Well, when you subtract one, it's equal to the total of two. So would, would, I think on tie, you just get retreated. So actually, Wood didn't get shattered. He did good. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Die rolls. If it's equal to the combat unit's quality rating, it must retreat one hex. So okay, there you go. So Wood got damaged on the defensive fire, then on the attack because he had a nice commander with him. Instead of being scattered to the winds, they retreat a hex. Shaver, same roll. Oops, subtract one. Uh oh, that's not good. A five compared to his grand total of four. Yeah, so he failed. He legitimately failed. Uh, so if you're, if it exceeds the combat unit's quality rating, the combat unit takes a step loss. If it's a defending combat unit, which it wasn't, uh, it doesn't have to retreat. So Shaver took a step loss. And because he's an attacker, not a defender, he doesn't have to retreat. But in that case, oh wait, let me see. Does the if it's equal to the combat unit's quality rating, must retreat. All right, uh, but now Peabody has to roll, and he gets a plus one to his die roll. So essentially, Peabody, no matter what Peabody rolls, because he's only got a skill of one, and he had to add plus one to his die roll, uh, he pretty much fails. And it says if you fail, you take a step loss, and if you're the defender, you retreat a hex. So. That didn't, that didn't hurt too bad. It's a step loss and a retreat. So the Confederate player definitely needs to, well, anybody, you definitely want to bring and organize your stack. That's why I'm saying this is interesting. For the Union player, it's going to take some time to really organize and bring all your troops together to make those stacks of 10 strength points. It's really kind of difficult, especially when you get one CP per turn and not much of a chance to get extra CP points until Grant arrives and then you can make the army roll against the commander for extra CP. But the Confederate player, you, you have a lot and it seems like they get to move a lot of troops frequently because they're on a coordinated attack. So this definitely puts the, the Union player on the defensive side. So as you can see, the rules I think are fairly simple. You know, just comparing your combat ratios, make a die roll, modify that, uh, apply some results, and you're fine. But where this game, game really shines, though, is in the strategies. Look at the horrible situation that the Union player has, and then how do they turn that around? And then how do you take advantage of your reinforcements? Because when your reinforcements come, if you fail a reinforcement roll and they're delayed, that delays everything coming into that same hex later on. So you can see that there's going to be a backlog of troops waiting to come on if you don't make good reinforcement rolls. Uh, also, how do you place your artillery is important. Like even with a gunboat, since I'm only limited to the river, do I just wait for the gunboat and then bring it back later? Because once you unlock artillery on a particular phase, it's available to you at any point later on in the game. So sometimes, it's best just to hold on to your artillery. Uh, you know, but as you start getting your troops closer together, then you know you might say, okay, I've got you know so and so in combat, let me drop artillery, that way it can participate in the battle. So there's this is a a very strategical game. So I'll put it out there like that. It's not difficult to learn, the rules are very straightforward, and you know the application is fine. It's the strategy and the depth on how I, I especially think the Union player has to organize themselves to form their counterattack and hold the line. And then how do they bring, you know, leverage their reinforcements that come on. I know, I didn't call them reinforcements because the scenario didn't call them reinforcements. But I'll say this though, um, when you play like the, let's see. If you do this attack on April 5th, it does actually say that there are Union reinforcements. And so Grant necessarily isn't going to come on at his uh, designated time because now, now they do fall under reinforcements. So uh, that's probably the only thing that I might be doing wrong is 
differentiating reinforcements versus units that get to come on. Because again, you know, at 9 a.m. it says grant and all this stuff comes on and it just tells me a time, but it didn't label them as reinforcement. Whereas the Confederate, it actually said reinforcements and gives you the time. So that's why, you know, that's, that's probably the only thing that I didn't quite get. And so the way I played it is the Union soldier, their troops just came on at the designated time. Unless your specific scenario rule says otherwise. That's how I played it. Other than that, yeah, it really just comes down to strategy. But the basic game mechanics are pretty simple. So, again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to me ramble on about my thoughts and some of the mechanics and how they work out. Uh, if you've played this, you know, this is uh, Shiloh Cruel Morning by Tiny Battle Publishing. Let me know your thoughts on it. Let me know if uh, this is interested in you and maybe getting it for yourself. What do you like about it or dislike? Um, because again, I don't have a lot of Civil War gaming experience. So maybe, maybe you've got some other Civil War games that you like to play. So go ahead and share your thoughts as well. And again, thank you very much for watching and we'll talk to you later. Bye.